Hello, welcome back to our bookshop in Tring. I'm Ben Morehouse. So we have another author interview now. Um, we're going to be talking to the wonderful Saul David in his book, uh, The Crucible of Hell, uh, dealing with uh, Okinawa, the last great battle uh, of the Second World War. Um, Saul will be in conversation with Roger Morehouse. Thank you, Ben. Um... Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Saul. We've got Saul David with us this morning, uh, talking about uh, Crucible of Hell, which is his latest book, um, on the back of Okinawa. Before we talk about Okinawa itself, Saul, it's a, it's a little bit of a departure for you, isn't it, doing the Pacific War? Well, how, what brought the book about? Yeah, it is a bit of a departure. I, what brought it about, actually, was my last book, which was a kind of bridge, I suppose between um, some of my previous work uh, going back to the 19th century mm -hmm. but also I've written books on the Second World War but not for a few years so I was uh, I was keen to come back to the Second World War so I wrote a book called The Force which was about a, a, a special operations unit Canadian and American and during part of their deployment they were sent uh, to the island of Kiska to retake the island of Kiska which were which of course is in the Pacific and um, it was a bloodless operation but it got me thinking about the Pacific and, and there was a you know, there's a real kind of sense from the, themselves they eventually deployed in Europe and they did extraordinary things in Europe but there was a real feeling among the soldiers themselves that they'd missed an opportunity to get into what they felt was the proper war and from mm -hmm. a British historian's perspective that's you know that's quite an interesting thought because we always think of of Europe and the defeat of the Germans as the key key uh, job and of course even the Americans admitted strategically that was you know it was Germany first nevertheless their emotional connection was to defeating the Japanese obviously because of Pearl Harbor and because the sea that stretched out you know directly from the shores of, of America to their enemy as it were and and so uh, I thought well is there is there an engagement is there a part of the war that probably has been slightly missed uh, and I came across Okinawa, and Okinawa seemed to have everything. It's got that bridge between the end of the war in Europe uh, and the end of the war in Japan. It's yeah. uh, undoubtedly one of the most vicious campaigns of the Second World War, really shockingly vicious, actually. And I was surprised to see the effect it had had on American servicemen. I mean, you think of soldiers once they've been into combat, of course, they're not unaffected, but you know, one type of combat is relatively similar to another. I've looked at combat through the ages, literally, from Roman times, and I have rarely seen a contest uh, that compares to this. We think of the Eastern Front uh, between the Germans and the Russians, uh, and possibly a subject you've written about, Roger, of course, the, the Poles and the Russians as being as bad as it gets, but this compares, I think, in, in, the, in the degree of awfulness. Um, so it's compelling in that sense, but it's also important in that it, it, it really has a significant end game, which is the use of nuclear weapons. Mm. And the connection between the battle and the decision to use nuclear weapons was one I had never heard made before. Uh, and yet, when you followed the beats of the story of the battle, and what's going on back in America with Truman and his chief advisors, and of of course, Roosevelt dies halfway through the battle, so you've got a new yeah. president. It becomes increasingly clear that there is a direct link between the battle and the use of those weapons. Well, we'll come around to that at the end, but can you just sort of tee up the, the Okinawa campaign itself and how it comes about, and for those that are unaware of precisely where it is and stuff, you know, give us, give us that detail. Yes, well, um, just briefly, of course, the, uh, the attack on Pearl Harbor has taken place in December 1941. That brings America finally into the war. Um, they begin their offensive operations in the summer of 1942 with a campaign on Guadalcanal, which is a real nail biter, actually. It almost goes horribly wrong. Mm -hmm. And that's the start, I suppose, of the American advance across the Pacific. It's really a two pronged uh, advance, one prong up through New Guinea and the Philippines, which is really MacArthur's uh, Axis advance, and another axis going through the Central Pacific, and that was Admiral Nimitz and his amphibious troops. <clears throat> and you finally get a meeting of these two axes of advance on the island of Okinawa, which is actually the most southerly of Japan's prefectures. So it's part of Japan proper, but it's not the actual home islands. It's 400 miles south of the most southerly home island, which was Kyushu. Mm -hmm. Uh, so you can see geographically, you, we're getting towards a, a, a moment where the Americans can launch their final assault on the islands of uh, Japan, which is what they assume they have to do to bring the war to an end. And Okinawa is important, is one, because it gives 
the Americans a sense of how tough the opposition is going to be when they get to Japan, but also geographically, its size, 70 miles long, they can use it as a supply base and as a jumping off point for that final invasion. So in their minds, this is the last step before the invasion and the, the invasion of Japan, no one is in any doubt by the end of the battle, it's going to be a seriously bloody uh, and costly undertaking. And that um, initial uh, invasion, that initial landing on, on Okinawa actually goes quite well for the Americans. So what, what goes wrong? I'm um, just briefly, I mean, to talk about death toll, which might, might be sort of jumping forward a little bit, but what struck me when looking at your book is that the death toll of the, of the Battle of Okinawa itself is, is directly comparable to the death toll in the Polish campaign of 1939, right? In terms of, you know, you could substitute the Americans for the Germans because they have a similar death toll and the Poles have a similar death toll. And in total, it's up to about, uh, it's up to about a quarter of a million, which is huge. Um, Okinawa is about you know over two months campaign versus five weeks but that's an interesting comparison to make because I don't think many people would necessarily assume that just fighting for one tiny island in the Pacific would necessarily cost that many lives. Um, no. As I said the, um, the Americans initially you know they'd, they'd land more or less un, uncontested on Okinawa so what goes wrong? Well, the, the, uh, the decision to not contest the landings is a deliberate one by the Japanese. Um, Buckner, the American commander, actually thinks he's fooled the Japanese. He's been yeah. so clever and landed where they weren't expecting him to. But no, that hadn't happened at all. The most recent campaigns, uh, island hopping campaigns, in which the Americans had landed amphibious troops were generally opposed. Um, Iwo Jima, uh, just a month earlier, and also the previous autumn, the, the landings on Peleliu. And many of the troops who landed on Okinawa had, had fought on Peleliu, particularly the 1st Marine Division, and they were expecting a lot of opposition. In fact, some of the, uh, the lead troops didn't expect to survive. They were told by their, their officers, you, you, you're probably not going to come through this, but someone's got to do the initial fighting. Well, the reason the Japanese didn't contest the landings is because uh, they changed strategy in the nine months prior to the battle itself. They knew that Okinawa was a, was a very likely objective for the Americans, in fact, for the Allies, because the British are also involved in this campaign. Um, but they uh, felt that they didn't have enough troops, in particular when the uh, Japanese High Command took away one of the best formations, the 9th Division, a very experienced formation that was on the island, and therefore reduced its defensive capabilities, not only by the quality of those troops, but by 25,000. So how many men were left? Well, about 100 to 110,000, but a good 20,000 of those were Okinawa militiamen and really not that effective in the field. So you've got about 90,000 Japanese troops, many of which actually were very good troops, but still the Japanese commander and his senior staff had come to the conclusion that this was not enough to uh, to protect the island if you were trying to hold the beaches. What you really needed to do was build pre-prepared positions in a series of incredibly formidable defensive lines. The island was perfectly suited for defense with its coral rock and the fact that it had a series of ridge lines in the lower third of the island and moving back towards the capital Naha and the old imperial capital, old royal capital Shuri, which was the final defensive position, the final redoubt known as the Shuri line. But they had spent nine months constructing defenses in these various um, uh, ridge lines, and they were incredibly formidable. They dug 60 miles of tunnels underneath these ridge lines. These uh, ridges were with interlocking fields of fire. If you took one ridge line and tried to get over to the next one, you'd, you'd be shot in the back because they, they fired both ways. Now, normally in positions like this, Rogers, you know from a military perspective, um, what happens if one ridge line gets taken over? you've lost all the men inside those positions. It didn't matter to the Japanese because every man was expected to fight to the finish. So there was no yeah. question of surrender. And that's what made these positions so difficult to, um, to winkle the defenders out of. And can you tell us something about that, that sort of peculiarly Japanese mindset, um, in, particularly in 45? It, it's something that seems very alien to us nowadays, doesn't it? It's completely mystifying. I mean, what one, one critic wrote, it, you know, it was, it was literally like traveling to the moon to see the attitude of, of, of the, their Japanese opponents. So what's really going on there? Well, you've got to get into the Eastern mind if you, if you can. And one of the things I tried to do in this book is to look at the story as much as I could from the perspective of the Japanese mm -hmm. and their Okinawan um, allies. Uh, 
Uh, and, and one of the things that strikes you is this complete willingness to lay down their lives, that is, not just Japanese servicemen, but Japanese civilians, in the cause of the state, a kind of sense of uh, self-sacrifice that's sort of Im imbued in Japanese culture and certainly in Japanese military culture. So, for example, when we look at the kamikaze as effect effectively early forms of, of uh, suicide bombers, the Japanese saw them as heroic um, uh, exploits in the service of both the emperor and the state. And, and suicide in Japanese culture and Japanese religion does not have the connotations it does in Judeo-Christian religion. It is not a sin, uh, to, so to speak. It's, it's something very honorable. Now you turn that on its head and the unwillingness of the Japanese to surrender for all the reasons I've just given meant that they treated uh, prisoners of war, allied prisoners of war, incredibly harshly. It's not a, it's not a justification, but it is an explanation. Uh, mm. And of course, for the American soldier from the Midwest or wherever he happened to come from in America fighting against this opponent who simply wouldn't give in, tended to harden him, of course. It, it didn't just harden him in the way he behaved towards those Japanese um, in, in vast quantities that is really hard to get, get our heads around now, actually. I think the Pacific War uh, really caused some very, very he ha harsh damage to the, to the psyche of, of mm. any of those frontline combat soldiers, um, uh, more so than those fighting in, in the Mediterranean and the European theatre. You mentioned, and I think your subtitle for the book is, it, is this, the Stalingrad of the, of the Pacific, which is, which is a strong thing to say, right? Yeah, that, that was a working title, actually, Roger. That, that, didn't right. finally, uh, that didn't finally work its way through the system. But yeah, I, I felt very much, um, as I was looking at the story and the, the brutality on both sides, the ruthlessness on both sides, the casualties, the suffering, the, the drawing in of the civilians to the story, it struck me that it was uh, the closest I could see in, in the Pacific War to the Battle of Stalingrad or other battles like it. Let's, let's face it, Stalingrad was not unique, although it was yeah. probably uh, the worst in, in its awfulness and its casualties. Now you mentioned earlier on, or just now, about, um, about the kamikaze attacks. That, the kamikaze attacks see a bit of a peak in the Okinawa campaign, don't they, particularly off, offshore? Can you tell us about that? Yeah, they, they had really begun in a formal sense um, in the autumn of 1944 during the, the Battle of Lake Gulf, where, um, of course, the Japanese are really beginning to be hard pressed. They're being pushed back. This is really the, the, the key battle for, Philipp for the Philippines. This is really the key battle for the Philippines. And they realized then that their naval assets are dwindling fast and that, that America, the United States Navy, is dominant. And the one weapon they, they, they develop in an attempt to combat this, to even the odds, as it were, is to fly planes for, um, with uh, bombs, 250 kilogram and 500 kilogram bombs, straight into naval assets, particularly aircraft carriers. If you can knock out the aircraft carriers, you can really destroy American naval power in the, in the Pacific. So that was the plan. And the American naval so carriers- it's, it's the beginning of asymmetric warfare. Yeah, exactly. And, um, you know, we, we, we're not going to defeat them in a conventional sense. What else, what else can we use? And um, so this really reaches its apogee in Okinawa, not just because things are getting desperate and the Allies are getting increasingly close to the home islands, but also because it was actually part of an integrated strategy. The Imperial General Headquarters in Tokyo genuinely believed that the kamikaze could cause so much destruction against American ships and British ships at Okinawa, that they would withdraw, leaving the land troops who'd been landed on Okinawa to its fate and literally to be mopped up. This is the words they used by the Japanese soldiers on Okinawa. I mean, it was a hopelessly optimistic strategy. And one you, you might say was, was born of desperation. And there's no question that it was, but they were having serious conversations that uh, this uh, kamikaze attack, Operation Tengo, as it was known, might actually succeed. So what sort of numbers are we talking about? 2,000 sorties, if you think about that, 2,000 flying bombs were flown against these American ships. And the American ships suffered hugely as a result of it. Um, more than 300 damaged and 36 uh, naval assets were sunk during the Battle of Okinawa. But no aircraft carriers were sunk, although many were hit. No battleships were sunk either. And, and that really sums it up. In terms of defeating American power in the Pacific, it, it really didn't work. 
And at the same time, I'm, I'm not, I wasn't quite sure about the geography, but the, 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 the largest, I think it's the largest battleship of the entire war, the Yamato is, is sunk at the same time as Okinawa. Is that off, off Okinawa as well, or is it somewhere else? Yeah, no, it's absolutely right. It's all part of the same strategy, which is you send in whatever you've got in a desperate attempt to reduce uh, American sea power. The Yamato uh, operation was really mad, and, and it was launched actually by a kind of misstep or, or sort of a few words spoken by the emperor, which were, you know, sort of chiding the Navy. I mean, he was being told about the kamikaze efforts against the Americans towards the end of March 1945. And he said, well, what about the Navy? Why isn't the Navy playing its part? Well, there was a good reason why. There was hardly anything left. Yeah. But the Yamato, the biggest battleship in the world, there was actually, it was actually a twin uh, with another battleship which had been sunk in the late Gulf battle. Um, but the Yamato was the biggest battleship in the world, a super battleship with 18 inch guns. I mean, a really wonderful piece of naval engineering. I mean, you could even argue over-engineered, certainly yeah. hugely costly to build, the flagship of the, of the uh, Japan Imperial Navy. Um, and because of these words spoken by the emperor, the naval chief of staff felt he had no choice but to send the Yamato in as well. So it was sent effectively on a suicide mission, didn't get, uh, as it happened, Roger, anywhere near the island of Okinawa because the uh, naval because the Americans sent planes to sink it before, before it got anywhere near. So it was a, it was a suicide one-way mission and two and a half thousand sailors, including a vice admiral, went down with the Yamato. Wow, wow. So just talk us through, the, the Americans land on, I think the 1st of April, <coughs> 45. Just talk us through the, in brief, the sort of the, the, the highlights of the campaign, if you can. Yeah, you've got this bloodless landing on the 1st of April 1945, Easter Day, as it happened to be at that time. And uh, very quickly, the Americans advanced across the island. In fact, they cut the island in two in uh, just two days. And within about five days, they created a really sizable chunk uh, that they are occupying in the center of the island. Now, the plan for them is to go north and south. They send the Marines north. Uh, the Marines don't come across that much opposition until they reach the Matobu Peninsula, where there's a there's a kind of mountain redoubt, and it does take a week or two to reduce that redoubt. In that time, the, the doggies of the 24th Corps, so you've got the American, uh, you've got the US Army troops going south, and they're the first ones who begin to uh, come across this incredibly formidable defensive system. They take uh, literally the first month to advance a few miles, by which point, towards the end of April, uh, there are strong suggestions to Buckner, the American general, who, by the way, was hugely inexperienced and a really quite a surprise to take the command in Okinawa because he had never commanded troops in, in, in battle before. And there was definitely something of politics involved here because the Marines, who are far more experienced, should really have been given the, uh, the, the main command. But because there are a lot of US Army troops involved, MacArthur was also having his say, uh, it meant that they had to choose uh, an American US Army general and Buckner was sort of the next in line. But Buckner was being advised by the end of April, really so tough as the Japan, so tough for the Japanese defensive positions and so many casualties are we taking that really the best thing to do would be to uh, conduct a second landing behind the Japanese lines on the south end of the island. He chooses not to do that. He's advised by his staff that there'll be logistical difficulties. They might not get off the beaches. But in my view, it's a real missed opportunity because we know from Japanese sources that the one real concern they had at this early stage of the battle is that the Americans were going to open up a second front. And they, they simply did not have enough America. Uh, they simply did not have enough troops to deal with that sort of uh, two-pronged advance. So mm -hmm. it's a great missed opportunity. And as a result, you get this slogging match through the center of the island in which yard by yard, uh, trench by trench, and hill by hill, the Americans uh, advance south, taking huge casualties all, all the time and, yeah, and inflicting huge casualties, not just on the Japanese defenders, but also on civilians who, of course, are caught up in the maelstrom. I mean, one of the great tragedies of the battle are the sheer number of casualties that incurred um, by the civilians. Uh, you mentioned uh, hill by hill, and that brings to mind the uh, Maida escarpment, which some of us might know about from the, from the film Hacksaw Ridge, which came out a couple of years ago. 
which I personally thought was fantastic. And uh, certainly as the grandson of a, uh, a Royal Army Medical Corps doctor, I kind of sympathised with the uh, with the narrative, but that 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 brings to mind the story of Desmond Doss, which is a, which is a remarkable one. Can you tell us about that? Amazing story. I mean, it's a story within a story, as it were. It's, it, so they made it into a whole film. There are books about Desmond Doss, and quite rightly, because you know, I agree with you. The the, the, the most impressive feats of courage, in my estimation, are cold blooded, and there's nothing more cold blooded than a medic trying to save his wounded comrades. But there are examples of this. You know, we know from the First World War the the two VCs. Uh, one in the First World War were won by a medic, and it and it's uh, it's remarkable that that those that was the double VC, right? The double VC by yeah. Chavas, um, yeah. and you know, of course, it's only been done I think two or three times in in British history. But when you look at those individual escapades uh, of Chavas, for example, I'm, I'm not downgrading them at all. But what what Doss does on the Maida Escarpment or Hacksaw Ridge, as it was known, is really beyond belief. Mm from Lynchburg in, in Western Virginia, you know, just a country boy who uh, believes that it's wrong to kill. He is not a conscientious objector. He's often described as such. He, he is not a conscientious objector in the sense that he's happy to serve in the American armed forces. He believes in the war effort, but he just doesn't want to kill. So he joins the medics and he's fighting on the Maider escarpment, or at least he's, he's assisting troops fighting on the Maider escarpment uh, towards the end of April and early May, 1945. This is an incredibly formidable position, just like all the other ones I've described. And after a few days of fighting, the Americans look like they're getting the better of it, and they look like they're about to take the, the ridge. But the Japanese launch this last all-out attack, and they drive the company that DOS is attached to, B Company, um, back off, literally off the side of the escarpment and down um, uh, yeah, a, a relatively steep drop, they climb back down these cargo nets, just as it's portrayed in the film. The only thing I will say, Roger, having seen the film myself, is that, uh, and having seen the actual escarpment, is the drop was much less <laughs> severe. Not, I mean, it's as steep, but it's, not, it's nowhere near as, as big as That's they right. make it out to be. But nevertheless, what was clear by the end of this action is that all the able-bodied men have left, and all that's on the top of the escarpment is DOS with countless numbers of American wounded who have been, you know, without being too brutal about it, abandoned by their comrades because mm -hmm. they've been ordered to withdraw. But the and only they can't expect any sympathy from the Japanese, of course. No, and they're not going to get any sympathy. If the, ja the reason the Japanese didn't advance and kill everyone is because they didn't know that the defenders had all left. If they'd known that, everyone would have been killed. So DOS is incredibly courageous, cold-blooded courage to stay with the survivors, treat them, he's got to stabilize them first, then drag them to the end edge of the cliff and lower them with a device he's, you know, he's rigged up himself. It's a double bowline knot that he, he sort of fits them into this contraption and he lowers them one after the other down the slope. It takes five hours of this incredibly backbreaking work all the time in which he is thinking, please God, please God, literally he's, he's imploring the almighty, just let me get one more. He doesn't think he's going to survive, but he can't leave while he knows there are any wounded on the, on the hill. So how many does he eventually say? Well, the, the original account said 100. He thinks about 50, but let's not split hairs. And his, his, um, his citation for the Congressional Medal of Honor, the highest award that can be given to an American, and serviceman was 75 but it, it was an astonishing act of courage that went on for hours uh, and it led to the, the the rescuing and saving of of many many lives it's a remarkable story uh dos of course survives the uh, okinawa campaign one notable person that doesn't is ernie pyle uh, can you tell us about him yeah ernie pyle probably the best known uh, american war correspondent he was already famous in the 30s for a series of, of articles he wrote as he traveled through the midwest he was a, a, a wonderful reporter in the sense that he, he, he was really chiefly interested in the experience of the ordinary soldier. And he became, as a result, because he told their story, a great darling of the ordinary American servicemen. They felt for the first time their sufferings, their tribulations, what they were going through was re reaching the American public. And it was getting there because of Pyle. Now, Pyle had initially served in the Mediterranean and the, and the Northwestern uh, campaign. He landed shortly after D-Day. Uh, he was very badly concussed. 
in a bombing that killed a number of uh, Amer a friendly fire bombing, a blue on blue, mm. that killed a number of American servicemen, up to 200, I think, including a lieutenant general. Uh, and he was so badly shaken by that that he, he came back to America and really swore he'd never go to the front again. But by the beginning of 1945, his conscience would not allow him to remain in America while ordinary uh, American soldiers were fighting and dying in foreign lands. And he's really persuaded to go to the Pacific because he hasn't reported from there before. And Pyle, uh, having arrived on the island with the landings on the, on the 1st of, of, of April, and he hasn't seen much action because at that stage he's embedded with the Marines who don't see serious fighting until the beginning of May. And so halfway through April, he decides to go on a separate amphibious landing of an island just off Okinawa, a place called Lushima or Ishima. And on that island, he is taking part in an advance. He's actually with a colonel. Um, you know, he thinks it's relatively safe, but of course, nowhere is entirely safe uh, on a front line, particularly in this nature of fighting. Uh, and two uh, trenches uh, that run along the side of the road, culverts, really. And he, he's talking to the colonel while the Japanese machine gunner is still firing. And what he doesn't realize is that the Japanese machine gunner is has got a bead on him. I mean, maybe it's luck more than anything else. And the bullets actually come through the side of the, of the uh, culvert and they hit him in the forehead and he's killed. And it's interesting that some of the soldiers are so shaken by his death that they say it affected them more than the death of Roosevelt himself, which, which gives wow. you a sense of how That's, yeah. highly in Remarkable. their regard he was held. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned earlier on about the connection between um, the Okinawa campaign and the atomic bombing that, that obviously is in August of 45. Can you elaborate on that, you know, how, how direct that link is? Yes, well, there's a key moment towards the end of the battle. The battle uh, starts on the 1st of April, as you've already explained, and it, and it ends on the 22nd of June when the 10th Army uh, finally announces that the uh, uh, that hostilities will cease. They've now got total control of the island. Um, just a few days before that, actually, also on the 18th of June, Buckner's been killed. He's got too close to the front line and he's hit by a, a Japanese anti-tank shell, probably. But nevertheless, he's, he, he dies of, of shrapnel wounds. Now, also on that day, there's a crucial meeting in Washington in which Truman's asked his chief military and political advisors, you know, OK, what plans have we got to, to force Japan to unconditionally surrender? And they say, well, we're, we're planning the invasion and it's going to take place in two uh, halves. First of all, we're going to invade the island of Kyushu, the most southerly island, uh, in November of 1945 with about 750,000 troops. And then we're going to launch a second attack on the main island, Honshu, in the spring of 1946 with another 1.5 million troops. Uh, casualties, uh, Truman asked, they're going to be huge. Now, during this meeting, they directly talk about how uh, serious the casualties were on Okinawa. Not just the American casualties, of course, they're chiefly concerned about those American servicemen, uh, and they are the largest of the whole Pacific War, but also uh, the number of Japanese who've died, both servicemen and civilians. I think the civilian death count of 125,000 is really chilling and really uh, makes a big impact on, on Truman himself, because he realizes, as do his advisors, that if the battle moves to Japan as it looks like it's going to have to before the Japanese surrender, you are talking uh, not just a quarter of a million, you're talking probably millions of deaths, mm. certainly millions of deaths on the Japanese side and up to a million casualties on the Allied side. And interesting enough, Roger, the British are also going to be heavily involved in this. So uh, Winston Churchill, of course, plays his part in the decision making process. So at the end of the meeting, Truman quite rightly asked, well, is there an alternative? Now, he's now aware of, the, of the, um, uh, this program to build atomic weapons, but what they don't know is whether they're going to work. So the Assistant Secretary of War, John McCloy, says, well, of course, we, we've got the atomic bomb in, in, you know, in, pro in preparation. Uh, we don't know if it will work, but we think it will. And if it does, I would advise, and your chief scientific advisors who are building a bomb, led by Robert Oppenheim, Oppenheimer, led by Robert Oppenheimer would advise that you threaten to use them and if the Japanese don't listen, you actually use them. So his decision at the end of that meeting is, okay, let's see what happens to the atomic bombs. Meanwhile, 
keep making preparations for the attack on the island. Go back to Okinawa, which has now been pacified, and all those troops who fought their way through and luckily survived Okinawa are now literally quaking in their boots at the prospect of invading Japan proper. And they're going to be joined by an awful lot of other troops drawn from all kinds of theatres, including some from Europe, who are going to have to fight on. So when we move the story on to the middle of July, uh, when they test the weapon, Truman and Churchill are now in uh, Berlin for the Potsdam Conference meeting with Stalin. And it's there that, that Truman hears for the first time that the test in New Mexico has succeeded. And it's there that he decides very quickly after discussions with Churchill that they must threaten to use it. And if they don't listen to the threat, they will, uh, they will actually drop these bombs. That decision uh, is uh, taken, as I say, at Potsdam. They issue the so-called Potsdam Declaration is ignored by the Japanese. They, you, know, you could argue, well, the Japanese don't know exactly what's going to happen next. And there is, of course, some truth in that. What they do threaten in the Potsdam Declaration is prompt and utter destruction. My contention is that no amount of threats were going to make any difference to the mm. Japanese at this point. To whether they should surrender or not. They do surrender, chiefly because the emperor comes down on the side of the, of the peace party at that point. But there are hardline elements in the military and uh, in the war secretariat who still want to fight on. And that's after both atomic bombs have been dropped. So the argument that they were going to surrender anyway before the dropping of the bombs, I think, is completely spurious. And personally, and we all have a different feeling about this, but even from the perspective of the 21st century, I don't think Truman had a choice. I think he followed the only logical uh, uh, decision to save not only American lives, but also Japanese lives. And yes, a terrible death toll was taken in Nagasaki and Hiroshima in horrific circumstances, but many fewer people lost their lives in those two conflagrations than would have done if the war had continued. You are, you are left with the impression a little bit with this, with Okinawa and the wider consequences that you mentioned there, that there, there's a sort of a um to use the word brutalization is too is too weak it's almost a breaking of the boundaries it's a breaking on both sides breaking of the rules of war if you like you've got kamikazes on one side and you've got um you know the decision to use the ultimate weapon on the other side is, it, do you get that sense as well is this is this part of the you know the, the sort of brutal culmination of the, the september uh, uh, pacific campaign I think I think uh, Okinawa undoubtedly played into that, but probably it was more relevant with the with the with, with the behaviour of the troops on the ground and the brutalisation of the combat troops than it was of the politicians and the senior generals. And the reason I say that, Roger, is because they they were already using incredibly destructive methods of of firebombing. Um, they had in Europe, as we know, very controversially against Dresden, and they'd also done it against Tokyo in, in March 1945, in which more people had been killed than actually would be killed in the atomic, uh, uh, in, in the dropping of the atomic bombs. So wow. uh, it, it wasn't just a question of Okinawa uh, brutalizing the minds or, or, or hardening the minds of American politicians. They were already pretty hard. Ongoing but I, process. What I think it did is convince them of the potential consequences of fighting on Japan proper. Yeah. I mean, the fighting for all those Pacific Islands was pretty brutal, but the, the opposition was getting tougher and tougher and tougher, and more and more lives were being lost as they got closer to Japan proper. And it's interesting from the perspective of the Japanese, when I was looking at some of the sources, I found the wife of a kamikaze pilot who she's really trying to explain her own feelings about how proud she was, you know, sad, but how proud she was that her husband was giving his life uh, for the emperor and for the nation. But she was also careful to point out that she herself was prepared to lay down her life and had indeed been trained in her factory to kill American servicemen when they came ashore with spears. I mean, a bit optimistic, I know, but nevertheless, they were gearing the whole population up to fight. And it's not so much a question of how much damage would they have caused themselves, it's how many of their lives would have been lost um, to American soldiers who would have had no option but to shoot them. It's a remarkable story. I, I mean, a last, a last question, Saul, is uh, do you think, you know, our Western narrative, you alluded to it earlier on, our Western narrative, particularly our British narrative, is, is very focused on the European war. Uh, do you think we kind of, we have a blind spot about the Pacific? Do we ignore it? Even the bits where Britain's involved, you know, Singapore and elsewhere, do we ignore it? I think we do ignore it. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a harder narrative for us. I mean, the 
The biggest thing, I mean, it's not the only disaster of the war, but the biggest single disaster of the war is Singapore, um, as you've, you've just referred to. Um, so, so do we see, by the end of the, of the fighting in the Far East, a chance for the British to redeem themselves? Yes, actually, we do, particularly with Slim's 14th Army in Burma and the big advances it makes. But the major effort in the Pacific War ultimately is made by the Americans crossing mm. the Pacific. They do the, the, the bulk of the fighting there. And it's, a, it's a, a narrative we're much less familiar with. I think we feel it's less important, but mm. it is vitally important to understand, as I've tried to make clear in this book, that the end game of the Second World War is still very unclear. So when we celebrate VE Day today, we often forget that not only was there still a war raging in the Far East, it was a war that was likely Certainly people would have believed uh, in, in April and May of 1945 that it's going to go on for an awful lot longer. And so the whole BE Day celebrations as we see them today may never have understand uh, the end game of the Second World War. Well, so hopefully your, um, your book can sort of rectify that, um, that myopia that we have in our British narrative, or at least start the process. It's a wonderful book, uh, as always, beautifully written and very insightful and, and well done. Thank you very much. Thanks, Roger, and thanks for talking to me. All the best. Thank you, Saul. Thank you to Roger for the wonderful conversation they've just had. Uh, absolutely fascinating. So um, Saul's book, Crucible of Hell, is available in our bookshop um, called... 01442827653. Um, all the purchase details and information will be um, other, underneath this video as well. Um, as an aside as well, Roger's um, books are also available um, through the shop. So uh, his um, uh, Hitler's Third Reich in 100 Objects, that is now in paperback. And his last book, which he came to the book festival in November, First to Fight, is also um, available in the shop. Uh, all signed, actually, from his perspective. Good. So thank you so much. We've got uh, plenty more author interviews coming up. Uh, do give us a, a, a shout if you um, have any requests for authors as well. I'm sure we can, uh, uh, we can but ask. So thanks again, and we'll see you for the next one.